Welcome back to Aero 1020, Theory of Flight, presentation number 10 on airfoils and wings. In this presentation, we'll discuss airfoil terms and definitions. We'll go over all of the different wing types and wing plan forms. And finally, we'll discuss aspect ratio and we'll learn how to calculate aspect ratio for a wing and what that means as far as the amount of lift and drag produced by a wing. So let's review the four forces that act on the airplane. First of all, we have lift. And weight or gravity opposes lift. And then we have thrust, which is produced by the power plant of the aircraft which is opposed by drag. Now Daniel Bernoulli's work with fluid dynamics led to a discovery which is now known as Bernoulli's principle. And Bernoulli's principle states that uh, fluid that is forced through a restricted tube or a narrow opening in a tube reacts in a way that the velocity of that fluid actually increases and because of that increased velocity the pressure in that section of the tube actually decreases. Now an airfoil is designed to take advantage of Bernoulli's principle. An airfoil is a specially shaped surface that produces aerodynamic lift as the air flows over it. Here's a cross section of an airfoil and one of the first terms that we'll discuss is camber. Camber is the curvature or the curved shape of the upper surface of the uh, airfoil. And the airfoil is designed with that curvature to accelerate the air molecules that flow over the top of the airfoil. Because of the camber or the curvature over the top of the airfoil, there's more surface area on the top of the airfoil so the air that flows over the top has to accelerate in order to keep up with the air that's flowing underneath the airfoil. Because of that acceleration due to Bernoulli's principle the pressure at the top of the airfoil actually is reduced so compared to the pressure underneath the pressure above is low, high pressure beneath the airfoil produces lift. So lift is a function of camber or the curvature of the airfoil and airspeed. Lift increases exponentially with airspeed and so a 210 square foot wing at 50 knots can lift a 2,000 pound airplane. So lift can be created as a result of Bernoulli's principle alone, but there's also another aspect of lift. When the air hits the bottom of the airfoil and flows over the top, it's deflected downward. This is called downwash. Because of this downward deflection, there is an equal and opposite upward reaction due to Newton's third law. As you recall, Newton's third law is the law of equal and opposite reaction. So as that wind is deflected downward, the wing reacts in the opposite direction and that also contributes to lift. So let's go back and define the term cord. Cord refers to the imaginary line that joins the leading edge of the airfoil to the trailing edge. The cord length is a distance from the trailing edge to the point on the leading edge where the cord intersects the leading edge. And you can see in this illustration the imaginary line from the leading edge to the trailing edge known as the cord line and the length known as the cord length. Now in this illustration we see an actual aircraft with the cord line from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the wing. And this is with the flaps up. If we extend the flaps, then we can actually change the cord line. 
because we've changed the location of the trailing edge of the wing. The next term we need to define is aspect ratio. Aspect ratio can be calculated in two different ways depending on the wing plan form. For a rectangular wing, we can calculate aspect ratio by dividing the wing span by the wing cord. If you don't have a rectangular wing, then you need to use the average wing cord, or you could calculate aspect ratio by taking the wing span and squaring it, and then dividing that by the area of the wing. The area of the wing is calculated by multiplying the uh, wing cord, average wing cord, by the wing span. So let's look at an example of a rectangular wing with a 40 foot wing span and a 5 foot wing cord. How do we calculate the aspect ratio? Well, it's a rectangular wing, so we can use the wing span of 40 feet and divide that by the wing cord of 5 feet to get an aspect ratio of 8. If we took the other route, we could square the wingspan and divide that by the area of the wing, the surface area of the wing calculated by multiplying the wingspan by the wing cord to get the same result. So the aspect ratio of a wing is the ratio of its wingspan to its mean cord. And it's equal to the square of the wingspan divided by the wing area. Or we could take the wingspan and divide it by the main cord to get the same result. A long and narrow wing has a high aspect ratio. A short and wide wing has a low aspect ratio. So again, there are two methods to calculate aspect ratio. We take the wingspan and square it and divide that by the wing surface area. Or we take the wingspan and divide it by the mean cord. In the next slide is a picture of a modern glider. And notice how long and narrow the wings are. Gliders are built with high aspect ratio wings because high aspect ratio wings uh, actually reduce the amount of drag created and increase the amount of lift. And since the glider doesn't have a power plant to produce thrust, it must rely on the production of lift to stay aloft as long as possible. In the next slide is a picture of the Diamond DA-40. The Diamond DA-40 has a power plant to produce thrust, so it's not reliant on producing just a high amount of lift to stay aloft. So the wings of the Diamond DA-40 are not as high in aspect ratio as the wings of a, a glider. So the aspect ratio for a Diamond DA-40 uh, can be calculated by taking the wingspan of 39.167 feet and dividing that by the wing cord, the average cord of the mean or dynamic cord of 3.675 feet. So the aspect ratio of the Diamond DA-40 is 10.66. So in this case, we've taken the wing span and we've divided it by the average or the mean wing cord. So let's go back and check our knowledge. The straight line that connects the leading edge and the trailing edge of the airfoil is called the cord. The curved line that determines the amount of lift produced by an airfoil is called camber. Let's look at some other terms. Here's a cross section of an airfoil. And remember the leading edge is the forward section of the airfoil and the trailing edge is the aft section and an imaginary line connecting the leading edge with the trailing edge is called the cord line. There's upper camber or the upper curvature of the wing and there's also lower camber. 
the mean camber line is the average camber. So it's a line drawn from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the airfoil that's equidistant at all points. Downwash is the downward motion of the air that flows over and underneath the wing. The angle of attack is the angle between the relative wind that's hitting the airfoil and the cord line. The center of pressure is the center or the area on the wing where you have the greatest amount of low pressure producing lift. Now the angle of incidence is the angle that the wing is attached to the fuselage. So it's the angle between the cord line of the wing and the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. The pilot has no control over this angle. It's a fixed angle. Now the angle of attack again is the angle between the relative wind and the cord line. And the angle of attack is controlled by the pilot. The pilot can control the angle of attack by varying the pitch of the airplane. Another aerodynamic term is thickness. And thickness, very simply, is the thickness of the airfoil at different points along the camber line. Now, when discussing wings and airfoils, you may see the term NACA, N-A-C-A, which stands for the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. And that committee was formed back in 1930 to study the different characteristics of different uh, airfoil shapes. And they discovered that the two greatest design factors to produce lift were thickness and camber. You may also see a term like NACA 2412. And that's a classification system that NACA came up with to describe different airfoils based on their maximum camber, the location of the maximum camber, and the maximum thickness of the airfoil. So when you look at the airfoil NACA 2412, you know that the maximum camber is 2% of the airfoil length. And the location of the maximum camber is at station 40% or 0.4. The maximum thickness of the airfoil is at 12% or 12% of the cord line. Let's look at some additional aerodynamic terms and definitions. Positive camber is when the mean camber line is above the cord line. Negative camber is when the mean camber line is below the cord line. A symmetrical airfoil is when the mean camber line is the same as the cord line. So the curvature or the camber of a symmetric airfoil is the same on top of the airfoil as it is on the bottom. Here's a picture of a symmetric airfoil. So notice that the camber is the same on the top and bottom of the airfoil. So the mean camber line is the same as a cord line. Now lift is a force. And because it's a force, it has direction and magnitude. And we represent lift with vector arrows. Aerodynamics define total lift as a force acting through a single point. And that single point is called the center of pressure. The center of pressure can be sub subdivided into two different centers of pressure, the upper surface center of pressure and the lower surface center of pressure. So let's look at symmetric versus cambered airfoils or non-symmetric airfoils. A symmetric airfoil is, has equal camber on both sides, upper and lower surfaces. Each half is a mirror image of the other. There's no difference between the upper part of the airfoil and the lower part. The mean camber line and the cord line are coincident, or they're the same. The symmetric airfoil produces zero lift at a zero angle of attack. And the center of pressure is constant. 
It doesn't vary even at different angles of attack. Now let's look at the characteristics of a cambered airfoil or a non-symmetric airfoil. A non-symmetrical airfoil has a greater curvature above the cord line than below the cord line, and the cord and the camber line are not the same. They're not coincident. The cambered airfoil produces lift even at negative angles of attack, and it produces more lift than a symmetrical airfoil. It has better stall characteristics than a symmetrical airfoil, and it has very good lift to drag ratio. And this last point is very important to remember. The center of pressure on a cambered or a non-symmetrical airfoil actually moves based on the angle of attack. So as the angle of attack increases, the center of pressure on a non-symmetric airfoil actually moves forward. A couple of other terms that we've discussed, upwash and downwash. Upwash is deflection of the oncoming airstream upward as it flows over the wing. Downwash is the downward deflection of the airstream as it passes over and past the trailing edge of the wing. So lift is a force. So what is a force? A force is a pressure acting in a specific direction and a force is a vector quantity. It has magnitude and it has direction. So we need to use vectors to show the force of a lift distribution around a wing or an airfoil. So lift is unique to heavier than air aircraft and it's defined as the differential pressure, the net differential pressure between the upper surface of the airfoil and the lower surface of the airfoil. And we represent that through lift vectors. A lift vector shows the direction and the magnitude of the force on the airfoil. Lift always acts perpendicular to the relative wind. In addition to lift acting perpendicular to the relative wind, it also is approximately perpendicular to the aircraft wing. That's the end of presentation number 10 on airfoils and wings. The next presentation, number 11, will be on airfoil design.